Hello, my name is Bob McEwen. I'm a professor of English here at Chadron State College. I write under the initials RF because that stands for Robert Fuller, which is my first and middle name. I'd like to read a poetry selection and a prose selection from my most recent work, Casey Joe McBride's White River Volume 1, as told to me, R.F. McEwen. I might as well say right off the bat here that I'm also Casey Joe McBride. Anyway, I want to say uh, a word about holding my hand over my ears. I blew my ears up with chainsaws here a while back, and it's been downhill ever since. But that's why I got this, not because I was fooling around making model airplanes and got my hand caught in some Elmer's glue, and now I can't get it off, in case you wondered. The poetry that I wrote for this particular book is in blank verse. That means we are accenting the first syllable of a word. We are unaccenting the, boy, you try this in class sometime. We are unaccenting the first syllable of the word and accenting the second syllable. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Now, if you do that straight through with every syllable, it's going to get boring. So we got to have some variations. A trochee, for example, is when you accent both syllables. I don't want to get into a lecture on blank verse, but that's the kind of poetry uh, that appears in, uh, in White River. And there are prose sections too. So the first one I'm going to read is a poetry section. And uh, again, it is written in blank verse where the first syllable of a line is unaccented and the second syllable of the line is accented. That's called a metrical foot. Five of those metrical feet is a line of blank verse. I don't want to get too technical about it, but that's what's going on. And the second selection is straight prose. I uh, hope you enjoy uh, the, po the poem and the, uh, uh, and the prose section too. Buried deep at Fast Horse Creek, one night I asked grandfather if we might explore the ground just south of Porcupine for arrowheads. The Boy Scouts went up there and found a bunch, I said. The Boy Scouts? Where, he asked. From middle school, the Boy Scouts, Gramps. They're on the go. They hike and camp around. They do their crafts. Their crafts, is it, he said. Who's heading up the craft department now? The science teacher, Mr. Norris, Gramps. Mr. Norris is the leader of the scouts. He had them south of Porcupine, they said, last April, now again this coming May. I hope they don't get poked, Grandfather said. It may be Carlos has a relative up there, can keep them clear of diamondbacks and bed the scouts down nice and cozy where they'll find a decent sleep. But Carlos heard, just coming in from Goodman's Produce, where he'd gone for bleach and suds. We've got a day to go to work and hang and fold, he said, against Aunt Rose's return. And she'll inveigh against us sure if we slack off you both have got more relatives up there than me. I won't abide a rusty bolt to shut me in. I say it's backstabbers and worse up there. It's arrowheads this time, Grandfather said. Boy Scouts are on the trail. Don't sell the science teacher short. Don't turn all sour against your blood. Although he smiled, although there was no anger in his voice, there was an edge. And Carlos turned his eyes to grandfather's and held them there for what seemed over long. It took some time before I came to reckon what I wasn't told, until my reckoning exceeded what I was. There's blood to go around, he said. 
There's not an arrowhead or bone they'll find that won't be bloody broke or ripped apart. I say, let him be. I looked at my grandfather, then to Carlos' little boy, and felt between them something hanging like the echo of a wounded hawk, the sound the wind made up at Fast Horse Creek the day they buried Carlos' sister, Pearl, when I was only four years old and bundled in a quilt, then set within a little grove of frozen, waist-high grass that stood between the burying and me. Her son, Sylvester, drove each nail into the cedar boards, each ring of steel on steel exploding down the creek like single shots or lone in single barks a grievous wounded dog will make before all hope is gone and death is nigh. And when the keening caught the air, the wind began to slice down from the ridge and make its moan a naked voice among the rest. And I was cold that time, despite Aunt Rose's voice, which caught the wind and shook it like she would a musty shawl. And when I think of it, though deep in August, the moon of ripening, when we would damp the ground beneath our quilts and sleep out back when breathing was a chore inside the house. No matter where I am, no matter now that 40 years are gone and since I sat lorn and chilled and terrified, surrounded by sharp stands of frozen grass, Sylvester's pounding and his mother gone, each nail exploding in the cedar planks, exploding down the twisted, barren length of Fast Horse Creek, and in the quaking heart of me, and with the keening and the wind, relentless, wave on wave, and me in mute debilitation while my relatives exalted in the futile massacre of everything that lives. I say a chill strikes deep within me like a piece of steel against a lethal edge of flint. And in that sound, in each reverberation, gaunt, quick, sharp, and clean, my blood congeals in sadness in the fathomless night chambers of my soul. Aunt Rose would not allow a bitterness to breed. The time for tears is short, she'd say. Blind Angus threads his needles by himself and beads without a light. Those arrowheads will have to burrow deeper in the bank, Grandfather said, or else the scouts will catch the lot and mount them on the nearest wall. The nearest wall's a further stretch out north, said Carlos. They'll se they sell pills and crafts, and when you come on time, you get free coffee, too. With this, the kitchen air began to clear like any sky would of an afternoon when storm clouds threatening dispersed or like a bitter soul would clear when suddenly enraptured in a long, unreckoned bliss. At least I hope they ask permission first, those scouts, said Carlos then. Who from, I asked. But he disappeared into the basement where we heard him rummaging with this and that. My grandfather was smiling. His eyes in consternation caught him struggling to keep his mouth from fracturing his mirth. Then Carlo's feet were heavy on the stairs. He held the laundry basket and he huffed. Let's make some suds and hang a load before the afternoon plays out, he said. Just sitting here, we're tempting wrath and I know who will win. This is a prose section I've entitled Aunt Rose's Relatives. A lot of people did not realize Aunt Rose spoke French. Her mother spoke some, but she was a Shangru, so I'm supposing it came natural to her. 
After I studied a bit in school, I understood that most of what Aunt Rose's mother spoke was just sounds and syllables that sounded like she knew what she was doing. She'd say, this is a Bordeaux accent, then come out with something. Or, this is how they ask for Wahhabi in Marseille, and then do that for a while. Aunt Rose, though, had been to the sisters and could really do it right. It, I found out about her prowess in foreign languages when three distant relatives visited up at Porcupine for several weeks. They'd come from France and were claiming enrolled blood status going back to Eugene Little Soldier, which wouldn't have gotten them any credit with the folks up at Standing Rock. They spoke French so well we couldn't understand a word they said, except Aunt Rose and Father Jack, a Jesuit from American Horse Creek who knew a lot of languages. There were two women and a man. One of the women looked like Mary Alice Charging Thunder. The other looked like Betty Crocker. The man was about Aunt Rose's age, with very black eyes and hair and skin like baking powder. Whatever Aunt Rose said, he thought was funny. When they came down to Shadron, they were interested in the French street names and in all the food Aunt Rose cooked. By that time, Aunt Rose could keep up with them pretty well. Grandpa and Carlos' little boy and I felt left out. Carlos said, I hope they leave. Grandpa added, pronto, tanto. Seems like he had a way with languages too, but not French. One of the reasons we were becoming vexed was because Aunt Rose offered our beds, which they jumped at, I should say jumped in, while we went out to the bunkhouse. Before we knew it, they were eating all our food. Grandpa had to go up to Wounded Knee for commods. They liked the cheese. And even though they drank a gallon a day until they were falling out all over the place, they claimed to not care for either Thunderbird or Richard's Wild Irish Rose. They called it re-shards. And when they did, Grandpa whispered, retreads. The morning of the third day, the guy came down to breakfast with his lower jaw tied up in a blue rag. He was pretty mad, too. You could see it in his eyes. They just blazed. And even though he did his mumbling in French, we got his drift. And in 10 minutes, they'd cleared out the lot they would have borrowed our truck, too. But Carlos ran out and snatched the keys out from the ignition, so they ended up walking the four blocks to the trailways. All that time, we didn't see Aunt Rose, but after they were off, she came skipping down the stairs with a look of merriment in her eyes and her right fist tied in a large white rag that smelled like liniment.